Now at 6 and streaming on CrossroadsToday.com, a two-vehicle crash at a Navarro intersection sends one person to the hospital. Plus, Victoria officials investigate a fire at a storage unit on Highway 87. And two people are dead after a house explosion in North Texas. We are pretty excited in the weather department because finally we got a little rain coming back into the crossroads. It's fairly light. You can see it right about there and it's going to fall apart once the sun goes down. But the rain chances actually increase as we get to the end of this week. We'll talk about that coming up in a moment. And the Yoakum Bulldogs look to fight for the playoffs this week versus the Hitchcock Bulldogs. That's coming up in sports. You're watching 25 News now at 6. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Don Brubaker. And I'm Shauna Curry. With Election Day next Tuesday, voters in our area are keeping an eye on several key races. 25 News Now reporter Trenton Whiting joins us with a breakdown on those races. Trenton? Don, Shauna, thanks. Obviously, the presidential election between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump is getting a lot of voters to the polls. Presidential races usually bring more voters out, but this election has truly piqued public interest. Another hot race is in the U.S. Senate between Republican incumbent Ted Cruz and Democrat Representative Colin Allred. Both candidates have experience on Capitol Hill. We've got several important elections close to home, too. There's the U.S. House of Representatives District 27 race between Republican incumbent Michael Cloud and Democrat Tanya Lloyd. Also, former Republican Jackson County Sheriff A.J. Lauterbeck and Democrat Stephanie Bassum face off in District 30. Several school districts in our area have voter approval tax rate elections, and there's one bond election. The Industrial ISD, the Yoakum ISD, and the Victoria ISD all have VATRE elections. The Hallettsville ISD has a bond election, partly for new athletic facilities. Two more items on the ballot include the District 43 state representative race with Republican J.M. Lozano facing Democrat Mariana Casares, and the District 17 state Senate race with Republican state senator incumbent Joan Huffman against Democrat Kathy Chang. We'll follow all of these races and more next Tuesday. Shauna, Don, back to you. All right, Trent, thank you. The polls are open for early voting this week in Victoria from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Voting is at the Dr. Patty Dodson Public Health Center, 2805 North Navarro Street, Classroom A. Early voting goes through this Friday, November 1st. This year's turnout broke the record for a single day during early voting in Victoria three times in a row. The record now stands at Thursday's total of over 2,100 people. Quero police are reminding residents of the consequences of sign stealing. Quero PD posted details on Facebook surrounding stolen political signs. There are reports of the same happening in Victoria as well. A Quero police say stealing signs is a crime and that suspects will be prosecuted. The charges may also include criminal trespass for entering a private residence. Quero PD is asking for anyone with information on any sign stealing or damage to contact the police department. With just eight days until Election Day, the presidential candidates remain locked in a tight race. Vice President Kamala Harris is talking about abortion rights and contrasting her character with her opponents. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump is hammering the Democratic nominee on immigration and the economy. Julia Benbrook has the latest on the race for the White House. The presidential candidates entered the last full week of the election locked in one of the closest races in recent history. Make no mistake. We will win. We're not going to take it anymore. Vice President Kamala Harris has big names joining her on the campaign trail in the final stretch. Because by every measure, she has demonstrated that she's ready. Harris emphasizing issues where polls show she has an advantage, abortion rights and preserving democracy. Her marquee event, an address Tuesday in Washington at the site of former President Donald Trump's January 6, 2021 rally that took place prior to the violent attack on the U.S. Capitol. He is focused and actually fixated on his grievances, on himself, and on dividing our country. The former president hosted a massive event in Madison Square Garden over the weekend, billed as the launch of the final stage of his candidacy spotlighting issues that voters favor him on, including the economy and immigration. The day I take the oath of office, the migrant invasion of our country ends and the restoration of our country begins. His message overshadowed by the remarks of Trump loyalists who spoke before him, including comedian Tony Hinchcliffe, who referred to Puerto Rico as, quote, a floating island of garbage. 
The Trump team released a statement saying the joke does not reflect the views of Trump or the campaign. Reporting in Washington, I'm Julia Benbrook. Well, as Election Day nears, safety at polling locations is a growing concern for many voters across the country. So we want to know, are you concerned about safety at polling locations? Yes or no? Right now, 79% of you say that you are not concerned about uh, any safety issues at the polling locations, but continue to vote. We want to hear from you. Simply go to crossroadstoday.com slash vote to participate, and we'll have the latest results on 25 News Now after Monday Night Football. A Victoria man faces two aggravated assault with a deadly weapon charges. Victoria police arrested 27-year-old Jacob Galliana on five charges total. He is in the Victoria County Jail in lieu of $62,000 bond. An El Campo man faces the charge of unlawful carry of a weapon with a felony conviction. El Campo police arrested 49-year-old Edwin Gordon on three charges. He is in the Wharton County Jail in lieu of $52,000 bond. Two people are dead after a house explosion in rural North Texas. There was nothing left of the home this morning in the small town of Van Alstine, about 50 miles north of Dallas. Due to a lack of fire hydrants, water was shuttled by multiple departments to a drop tank at the scene. About two thirds of the house was leveled. The two homeowners who were in their 60s died. Officials are investigating if a possible propane leak was the cause of the explosion. And Victoria fire officials are investigating the cause of a boat fire. This happened at a storage facility on Highway 87 at Kingwood Forest Drive. A motorist driving on Highway 87 reported smoke coming from the storage facility. Victoria Fire Captain Andrew Goss says even though there was a lot of smoke, the fire was contained inside a small area. Uh, when we arrived, uh, there's heavy smoke. Uh, we got all the doors popped. It turned out to be a fire in just one of the units. Uh, it was a boat that was on fire. We got it pulled out of the unit, put out, and uh, everything's good now. No injuries, uh, no real damage. The cause of that fire is under investigation. A woman is ticketed after a two vehicle crash at Navarro and Salem Road. Police say the driver of a white SUV had a green light and was turning left onto Navarro when the driver of a silver sedan ran a red light causing the crash. One person was taken to the hospital for minor injuries. Now let's take a first look at your forecast. Here's First Warren Storm Team Chief Meteorologist Mac Pettis. Max, th thank you for no rain this weekend, but what about later in the week? Well, we're excited that we do have even a chance of getting some rain later this week. Now, okay, the Halloween trick-or-treaters may get mad at me, but uh, we'll be talking about it. Now you can see how we had a few little showers that came ashore this afternoon. Uh, we, of course, are waiting for that frontal system. That'll be here on Thursday. And then we'll talk about how much rain we'll get. It's not a whole lot, so don't worry. We'll have more on your forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Back to you. Mac, thank you. Family members of the two-year-old daughter of East Texas death row inmate Robert Roberson sent a letter to the Texas House Committee that stopped Roberson's execution. The family of Nikki Curtis says they're convinced he's guilty of her murder. Roberson was set to be executed last Thursday after he was convicted in the death. The Texas Tribune reports State Representative Jeff Leach, a Republican, texted a Texas Court of Criminal Appeals judge last week that Roberson deserves a new trial. That's an apparent state violation. Sean Diddy Combs is accused of sexually assaulting a 10-year-old from Los Angeles in a new suit. That is one of two new lawsuits filed against Combs today. In a separate civil lawsuit, Combs is accused of sexually assaulting a then 17-year-old man auditioning for the reality show Making the Band. The lawsuits were filed by Tony Busby, the same Houston attorney who said he is evaluating claims by more than 100 alleged victims of Combs. Several have already been filed in recent weeks. A man who was arrested Thursday after he was accused of assaulting a 69-year-old elections worker at a San Antonio polling location bonded out of jail. 63-year-old Jesse Lutzenberger entered a polling location Thursday. Authorities say he was wearing a Make America Great Again baseball cap. Texas law bans voters from wearing political clothing near a polling location. Lutzenberger was told to remove his hat. He did. He voted and put his hat back on. The elections clerk asked him again to remove the hat. Lutzenberger then punched the clerk. Lutzenberger was charged with a third-degree felony.
Philadelphia's district attorney is suing Elon Musk over his million dollar voter sweepstakes. DA Larry Krasner filed the suit Monday calling it what he called an illegal lottery scheme that violates lottery and consumer laws. Pennsylvania law requires that all lotteries be conducted by the state. The DA, DA says Musk's sweepstakes don't meet those guidelines. Musk and his pro-Trump PAC are offering the daily $1 million giveaway to register voters in swing states who signed a petition supporting the First and Second Amendments. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit the like button and click the notification bell to receive alerts. Stay with us. Coming up on 25 News Now at 6, crab fishing season is postponed again to protect endangered whales. Also ahead, a California man is still waiting for his $44 million Powerball payout. Welcome back. In California, crab season is delayed to protect humpback whales. The fishermen who catch Dungeness crab as part of their livelihood are struggling to stay afloat. It's delayed for the seventh year in a row to keep whales from becoming entangled in trap and buoy lines. Dungeness crab fishing season was supposed to start November 15th, but it has been postponed again for the seventh year in a row. It's been a huge disappointment. This delay is in an effort to protect endangered humpback whales from getting dangerously entangled in crab fishing ropes, which can be deadly. It's like a ball and chain that just keeps digging and digging into their fins. It can get entangled in their mouth, their pectoral fins. With lots of whales off the central coast waters. We've had a really high number of entanglements this year. At least four have been uh, identified as Dungeness crab fishing gear from the last season. It's not really looking good, unfortunately, for an opening uh, before New Year's this year. These delays can take an economic toll on fishermen as they shorten their ability to catch the crab during season. And over the years, many local seafood restaurants have been seeing the effects. You know, people are like, well, the ocean's right there. You know, where's where's all the crab? And it's like, oh, I'm sorry, it's been delayed. Especially for the holidays. Well, fresh crab during the holidays is really big for locals here. I mean, they really love the local Monterey Bay crab. But a solution could be on the horizon for future seasons. Pop-up fishing gear, which eliminates the vertical line that entangles whales. Hoping to see happen is that in the, in the event of these closures for, for the conventional fishing gear to protect whales, the fishermen could keep fishing with the pop-up gear. A California man is still waiting for his $44 million lottery payout. A man we only know as Jerry says he won the Powerball jackpot on August 19th and has not seen a single cent of it. Lottery officials won't comment on his specific case, but they do say it's common to take six to eight weeks and sometimes longer to arrange payment. That's because winners go through a lengthy vetting process, which includes making sure they don't owe back taxes or child support. So for now, Jerry's still waiting for his life to change. <laughs>
Well, a North Carolina man, his life changed. He could not believe his luck. Last Tuesday, Jerry as well, Jerry Hicks, <laughs> went to a convenience store and found $20 laying in the parking lot. He picked it up, went into the store, and he used the money to buy a scratch-off lottery ticket. Turns out that ticket was worth a million dollars. Hicks is opting to get a lump sum payment instead of getting smaller amounts over 20 years. He has spent his life as a carpenter and says that he plans to use the money to help his children and finally retire after 56 years on the job. I'm going. Which state is that you're waiting on, man? I'm, I'm looking at my ticket. <laughs> we're, we're wanting to get some, some luck with the rain. I was pulling it out going, wait, 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 what number was it? <laughs> anyway, yeah, maybe we'll have better luck with the rain because it is beginning to show up. Right about now, we're looking at our temperature still in the 80s, about 83. We managed to get up to 91, I believe, was our high today. And of course, that's... Uh, all, you know, 11 degrees above where we're supposed to be, it's supposed to be cooling down, but there's good signs that frontal systems are beginning to move, that we may have some rain later this week, and yes, it's Halloween. We'll talk about that coming up in a moment. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're looking at some actual showers that rolled up into the crossroads. Can you believe it? Look at that. Pretty exciting stuff down in Calhoun County. They got a little bit of rain. The rest of the state doesn't know what we're talking about because it's just bone dry. But it's a good sign of the season that frontal systems are beginning to move up north and eventually we start getting into our area. For us, we had enough moisture to get that little light rain going. You can see right about there, and we're going to zoom in right about here. There's uh, Calhoun County, there's Matagorda County. You can see the activity. It's very light, but it's something, you know, it's been 30 days that we've had any significant rainfall around here. And uh, as uh, we've been talking uh, as of last week, as of Thursday, we are now in officially a moderate drought because you see all this area kind of in the yellow here. Uh, that is all moderate drought. Uh, up here, it's a severe drought, which would be the uh, watershed for the Colorado River. That would go all the way up into the Highland Lakes. And then from San Antonio West over to Medina, uh, they're looking at extreme drought. So yeah, we need to get something going. What we expect this week is not going to end the drought. It's just going to be a little sprinkle here and a little sprinkle there. There you see the activity. There you see the winds coming up and getting a little stronger. Uh, that's really pumping up the air. But what we're looking at is right here. This is a, one of those big storms that's rolling out of the Rockies. We saw this one out in the northwest last week. It's now here. Uh, winds are very warm in this sector right about there. It's colder behind it. And that frontal system will get close to our area. but. No cigar. It's the one that's actually farther west that's going to get here on Halloween 
and then fall apart. So it's okay. It's not going to be a huge cold front, but it'll be close enough to get us a little bit of light rain activity. There you see how everybody here is warm and in the 80s. Here's that frontal system you just saw. You can see how temperatures dropping into the 50s and 40s throughout the northwest. They're even getting their first snow showers up in the mountains of the northern Rockies. So this is that cool air that's coming down. Problem is, it's a little early in the season. Not going to quite make it to our area, but it will affect your weather. Uh, down south, we have this 40% chance of some actual tropical development uh, within the next seven days. The good news is that last week it looked like it was closer to the Yucatan Peninsula. It's about four or 500 miles to the west, to the east rather. As a result, whatever organizes here will be traveling to the north and east over probably Cuba, probably uh, the Dominican Republic, possibly Puerto Rico, and then head out into the Atlantic. So let's just say the following. Good news, not Florida. Good news, probably not hurricane, but tropical systems nonetheless still developing out there. Now, we take a look at the big picture, and what we're going to look at in the next few days is this big trough. You see that? And you see the snow and the rain? And there's the front that comes down into our area, and that's on Thursday. Then it falls apart, and then the moisture backs up over the area. So by and large, we're back to some sort of humidity around here over the next few days. Partly cloudy, a little breezier. Tomorrow, 85 in Port Lavaca, 87 in Cuero. And like I said, a slight chance of rain, even a 40% chance on Thursday. None of this severe, none of this huge, but maybe a little wetness around here uh, right on Trick or Treat. That's your seven day forecast. Reminding everybody, we do have a QR code. Love for you to scan that. Put Crossroads today on your phone, okay? Shana, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Mac. Well, we're on the other side of the weekend, so Max Williams joins us now with the other kind of football. <laughs> That's correct, Shana. Both UHV men's and women's soccer teams are looking to help their causes heading into postseason play. That's coming up in sport. Everyone, we are just two weeks away. Yes, just two weeks from playoff football here in the Crossroads. And some teams, they're looking to get better seeds. Some teams are fighting for home field. And a couple of teams are looking just to get into the playoffs. And one of those games we're looking at here this week is between the Hitchcock Bulldogs and the Yoakum. Yoakum Bulldogs, so the Battle of the Bulldogs basically for Hitchcock. They are 3-0 in district play. Again, they won in a high-scoring affair, came down literally to the last play versus the Columbus Cardinals last week. And again, for Yoakum, they need to win this game in order to stay in playoff contention there in 3A Division I. So Yoakum, they're heading off their bye week, and they're hoping, again, the big connection this season for them has been Trey Cuellar and Xavier Barnett. 
throughout this entire season so far. So for Hitchcock, they got a top offense though, led by quarterback Lowe joins the third. And again, they got a good running game as well. So this game is going to be a lot of points. And can Yoakum keep up with a top team there in Hitchcock? And now we're going to our viewer poll. And it's a little bit different here from the past viewer polls where I talk about here high school teams and what to expect. We're going into NFL football. And here's the viewer poll I asked. Who is your favorite NFL player from the state of Texas in general. So here are the options here for tonight. We got running back Earl Campbell, quarterback Drew Brees, quarterback Patrick Mahomes, running back Joe Mean Green, Mean Joe Green, pardon me, D lineman Michael Strahan, and then the other selection. And right now it looks like it's a battle. Again, other looks like it's there. People pick for Earl Campbell, one of the best running backs out there in this state of NFL. So we're going to see what if it changes a little bit going into the 10 o'clock show. But now we go over here to this week's Dave Campbell's high school football rankings. And there are a couple of changes here for area teams there in 4A Division 1. El Campo drops down to number 10 after their close loss there to Bay City last week. And then 3A Division 1. Edna jumps up there number 2. Still undefeated right now for Edna. And then 2A Division 1 though. You got Refugio is going to be at number 2. And Ganado drops one spot even though they had their bye week last week. And then in 2A Division II, the Shiner Comanches, they move up one spot to number nine. They're five and three overall record for Shiner, and they're on, again, a five game winning streak. And now, how about some soccer? UHV men's and women's soccer teams. They had their senior days this past Saturday versus North American, and both of these teams, again, won. The women's team won five to nothing this past Saturday. The men's team won four to one. And then also in last week's game, grad Kylie Spree Colos had a hat trick in the game and also broke the record for the women's soccer single season goals record. It was first set by Shelia Colpo and then Emily Lopton there for the women's team for the Lady Jaguars. And Colos said she feels very honored and happy that her entire family showed up to witness this event. And the women's team, they can host a quarterfinal game here at home if they can win both games. And then Texas A&M, Texas Arcanda and LSU Alexandria both lose or tie and then the men's team all they got to do is if they win here this Thursday they can plinch a playoff spot if they can beat Our Lady of the Lake University and then also we had some huge news here for Quero wide receiver there Walker Dietz he got an invitation letter to the National Combine there in the U.S. Army Bowl game and again that's one of the big there bowls that you see towards the end of the year there for the Gobblers again Dietz has been one of the top wide receivers from this entire season, so no surprise. He was our athlete of the week there earlier this year, so props up to him and just all the rewards that's going on here in sports. And that's going to do it here in sports. Don and Shauna, back to you. Max, thank you, and we're back in a moment. Mexicans dressed as skeletons took to the streets of their capital on Sunday in the annual Katrina's Parade.
And finally tonight, the annual Katrina's Parade was held in Mexico City last night. Dancers and people of all ages filled the streets with color as revelers wore costumes and face paint to imitate the Mexican skeletal figure known as La Katrina. In 1910, illustrator Jose Guadalupe Posada sketched the image of La Katrina as a social satire. The Katrina's Parade takes place ahead of Day of the Dead, also known as the Dia de los Muertos, three day Aztec <laughs> celebration in late October, early November. So, so many people recognize this week as Halloween week. We yep. understand that. Also, there is more to it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big, it's a big Much celebration. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. Halloween is a, uh, um, what, what is it? It's fun. A, fun and fun, fun. Yeah. This <laughs> is, Dia de los Muertos is when you go to the cemeteries mm -hmm. and you commune with the yep. dearly departed. You're remembering and honoring Hi, Grandma. How are you? Good to yeah. see you. Here's your favorite beer and here are your favorite <laughs> cigarettes. You know, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So we remember the dearly departed. So anyway, folks, I know it is uh, Halloween and everybody's got their costume and all that good stuff. But Thursday we do have a chance of a few showers. Now this is not huge. I don't think it's going to affect you really, but it may be a little on the damp side. And temperatures will slowly creep down to the lower 80s this week. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to join us back here tonight after Monday Night Football.